And uh, welcome back, everyone. I would like to introduce David Nguyen, the recruiter for, from RBC, who is joining us today to share his thoughts on branding. Because very often our clients ask us, like, uh, why should I do that? And we always believe that the recruiter, secretly or not, like officially, formally, they do check your profiles on the social media. So we want to hear firsthand from David, is it true or not? Welcome, David. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, everyone, for joining this morning for this wonderful session that we've had here. Now, just to give you some context, <clears throat> I'm a recruiter at RBC. I've been with RBC for close to about five and a half years. Um, time has passed by tremendously, but I actually know Dennis through my previous work with him. We used to be good coworkers next door. And um, we have taken different paths, of course, has taken us to different areas of RBC, but um, very much, of course, our work and our way of getting to helping individuals has brought us back together. And I'm here with you to kind of share with you some of my thoughts as a recruiter um, and also to give you some guidance too. I do also have here with myself, my puppy, this is Ollie, and she is just turning one year old. She's rather lazy, but um, she's here with me and she's a part of my brand, if I can speak about that. <laughs> so with that being said, without further ado, let's get started. Now, we talked about the elevator pitch being a core component of how you would actually be able to share your brand. What if I were to ask you, the elevator pitch could be used somewhere else? And your answer would probably be, well, David, that seems a little bit unconventional. Um, I probably would want to use my elevator pitch when I'm facing an employer. That's not necessarily true. You're using your elevator pitch every single day as you're discussing with you know, people that you've met for the first time. So if you're meeting with, uh, as Dennis shared, someone's family member in terms of like your partner's family member, could be the coach for a sports team. It could be, you know, your employer's friend or your boss's friend. It could be anybody. So in the way that elevator pitch work, you're actually doing it in more ways than you think. And I want to get you to think about this because the elevator pitch also ties in to how you present yourself when you're looking for jobs. What does that mean? So when you are applying for jobs and you're looking for opportunities, most individuals will have a way to present themselves. And usually those are the standard formats, like the resume. So that's your CV, your resume, your LinkedIn profile, your social media presence, so Facebook, Instagram, maybe even TikTok. And it could even be the final component that is your in-person brand in terms of the people that already know you. So those are the channels we can think about, right? What I'm trying to say is the elevator pitch is being used in all these different channels. And you need to be very cognizant of how you are presenting yourself and how you want to be perceived in this manner. In fact, if I were to share with you, I'm David, I'm a recruiter at RBC. I'm also a part-time YouTuber. And on the side, I love photographing and I do product photography. And I also work on my YouTube channel and I make all my own videos. And I discuss matters that have to do with mechanical wristwatches. Right, So I started the YouTube channel last year. That's a part of my branding. I can talk about that freely. And that bleeds into what I'd like individuals to see in my LinkedIn profile and my resume as well. So I just wanna leave you with that. Moving on. Now, this is Sean. I want you guys to be nice to Sean, okay? And we're gonna watch a video about Sean in terms of the impression that he's left with us. I want you to imagine this could be, you know, either you're meeting Sean in person or for the first time over, let's say, a video call, okay? Now, if Dennis can play the video, I'm going to get you to kind of watch the video carefully. And then after you watch the video, I want you to describe Sean in three words in the chat, okay? What do you think of Sean? Go ahead. Oh, hi. You work for a bank? My name's Sean, and I would really like to work for a bank. More about me? Well... Thank you. Oh, hi. <laughs> bank? My name's Sean, and I would really like to work for a bank. More about me? Well, uh, I graduated from college a couple of years ago. Can't say my program was that useful, but I learned a couple of things, and 
guess it's better to learn something rather than nothing, right? Since then, I've kind of been exploring my options. So I work part-time as a dog walker. So I guess you could say I'm a real people person. Uh, oh, sorry, one second. Right, okay. Uh, for fun, I like to travel and read and mostly binge watch a lot of TV. And so I was kind of thinking of starting my own blog, uh, but you know, I just don't have the time. Anyway, I would really like to work with you. Uh, where was it that you worked again? Okay, so in the chat, in three words, describe your thoughts about Sean's first impression. Think of some words. And we'll summarize them too. Yeah, could be that. Yeah, exactly. So Aurora says not serious. Tomas says wrong dress code. Aurora says playful. Rosalind says sloppy, unprepared. Okay, Moshtaba says lack of confidence. Yeah, it could be very well that he's projecting that too, right? Just from the body language alone. Yeah, that's correct. And Falaki says absent-minded, unprofessional. So we're kind of saying all the same things. You would agree, right? So now I want to ask you guys a question about Sean. Would you agree that maybe Sean would make a great friend? Just based on the, the conversation you heard? I want to hear from you in the chat. Yeah, Aurora says yes. Okay, Venus says maybe. Okay. Aurora says he's fun to be with. Yeah, he's, he's a dog walker. He demonstrated that he has interests, right? And he seems like a very friendly and nice guy. But again, we're talking about the way he project himself was not very the most organized way and not very um, considerate of the person he's speaking to, right? Especially if you're an employer. Now, let's say in terms of an employer, would you hire him? Yes or no? Okay, this says no, yeah. Okay, Aurora says no, okay. We have Ahmed who says no as well. Venus says no. Yeah, so for the most part, you guys are kind of on the same page too. First impressions are really all we have when we meet with someone for the first time. And that first 30 seconds makes such a critical deal in terms of what information that person can gather from you. Now, sharing from my perspective as a recruiter, I'm a recruiter that does recruitment for North and South Island BC, but also for um, Calgary as well, indirectly. And what I see all the time is people making their first impression on their resume. And you might be thinking, well, David, how does someone do that? If I were to share with you, it takes me all but 15 to 25 seconds to review a resume. That's all the time I have. In one single day, I review close to about 230 to 280 resumes on the average. So if you think about the number of things I can, information that I can gather and get from an application, from a resume, and get a first impression, it's not, it's not a whole lot granted the time that I've been given to review all these resumes, right? That being said, in the, inside of the resume, and inside of your LinkedIn profile, really what does get the attention of the individual that is maybe the recruiter? What kind of first impression are you leaving with them? And that actually falls into the impression you want to leave with somebody inside the resume is exactly how you'd want to leave with them in person. There is no fundamental difference. So you wouldn't want to approach it from the angle of how Sean is doing it, right? You would agree with me for the most part that if you projected yourself as Sean did inside of your resume or LinkedIn profile, that may not go well. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so just looking at the discussion that we've had so far, we've agreed that so far, Sean may not be the best individual to work with. And it's because he's lacking the professionalism. He even forgot who he was speaking to. And also looking at the way he's dressed, it seems like he's not quite comfortable or confident and not really considerate of who he's speaking to. If it was a recruiter, you probably would not want him to you know, show up in a hoodie and especially checking his phone halfway through, right? So again, all those things are quite important. Of course, that ties into um, how you present yourself and how you want to be perceived. Moving on. Okay, <clears throat> so we have a tool here. It's called RBC Upskill. And this is a tool that RBC has actually developed with FutureFit AI. And you're asking, well, David, why are you presenting this? 
the thing we have to understand is that right now, when we look at the job search process and we look at the opportunities to get information to, let's say, make a decision on a career choice, we're inundated with information, right? So the thing is, RBC has acknowledged that this is a concern for a lot of individuals who are looking for work and new skills. We've designed this platform as an all-encompassing system that has basically, you can upload your resume and from your resume, it will actually recommend jobs and skills for you. And these are actually live job postings all across Canada. Not only just that, but when you upload your resume to RBC Upskill, it will even recommend you certain skills that you can get from free online courses, such as from Waterloo University, from Harvard, from local Canadian universities too, like UBC, okay? And these are online courses that they have recommended to you because you've indicated you want to, let's say, be an engineer or you want to work within the field of data analytics, or potentially you want to work at a bank and you want to be an advisor, right? So when you use this tool, it guides you with the unlocking your career potential in multiple ways, with getting you in front of job postings, with getting you in front of the uh, free opportunities for you to take advantage of to upskill yourself. And that is what makes a very powerful experience in recruiting. For us as well, because when we look at this kind of tool, I would say that between LinkedIn, between Indeed, between Nuvu, and between Kijiji, and also um, individual corporate websites that have job postings, it's just far too much for you to search for job opportunities. So with that being said, it is actually a completely live tool that's updated routinely with new job opportunities and it pulls information from all other job postings and databases across the globe, okay? It's a very powerful tool. I hope that you have some opportunities to look into it. It's called RBC Upskill. If you Google RBC Upskill, it takes you directly to that page for you to give it a try. Now, I want to share with you a couple of perspectives from myself as a recruiter. When I do look at individuals and I tie in the part about what am I looking for in terms of hiring them? The question that comes up for me quite frequently is, well, David, do you actually look at social media? Do you look at where I've applied? Does that all matter? And the answer is it really depends, okay? So in the recruitment process, if you think I, I just shared with you that I review up to 280 resumes a day, I may not have the time and the ability to dig deep into looking at social media for every single candidate, unless I have a reason to. And when, what I say by that is, imagine this, I've pre-screened 280 resumes. I've come up with a list of maybe 20 gold medals that I'd like to maybe pursue further as potential candidates to move along the hiring process. Between these 20 candidates, what makes the fundamental difference between them is at that point in time, if I see two candidates that are quite equal to each other, and what makes a dividing difference between them is the other person has a professional social media presence, okay? So at that point, I may actually dig in and research their LinkedIn profile. I may look at the links that they provided in their resume. So thinking about any portfolios that you have, any projects you've worked on, any art galleries or photography galleries that you've had for yourself, Anything that ties you to what you are as an individual is helpful for me to get an impression from you. That final component of social media and getting a feel for your presence is what drives me to say, I want to go ahead and move that individual to the next step and potentially hire them or interview them actually, because I'd want to interview them. And then at that step, when the interview goes to the standards of what I'm hoping to get, I would then hire them. So thinking about that, that ties in the whole idea that your brand really does matter. If I can just move on to the next slide here. Okay, so now this kind of brings us to the q and section. And I want you guys in the chat to just engage with me. If you have questions, I will try to address them as best as I can. But I also want to just say a personal thank you for joining today's presentation. 
for listening intently. We have opportunities for you as well, and I believe that Dennis will share them. I'm not sure, Dennis, if we have those um, available or those will be sent out later. Maybe send out later will work, yeah. Perfect, perfect, okay. So thank, thank you. you very so much, that David. Said, that was absolutely amazing. And uh, it really is so connected with our programs, with the networking, with the branding. And here is another hero in Eric. Uh, this is April Zank I'd like to introduce to you, who is going to help us with the Q&A. She's going to read the questions because it's easier for you panel to respond to those questions. So questions can be not just to David, but also to Fulake and to Janice. And before April starts, I have a question to you, David, about your beautiful puppy. <laughs> can, <laughs> can we continue this discussion? Because in our workshops, when we um, talk to people, especially the last two years, we had like the protocol presentations, the your image and like the networking. So we would always tell to clients, no cats, no dogs, no kids around. Lock them in the <laughs> other uh, room while we have a job interview. So my question to you is, um, is it because you're just a recruiter and you can afford whatever <laughs> image you have with us? What's your recommendation <laughs> to our clients? Yes, of course, you want to be considerate of individuals in an interview with you, and you want to have a professional presence. There's no doubt about that. But I also feel like, you know, you have to get a gauge for this, too. If you are, let's say, applying for a company that is a startup, for example, and you might know somebody that is working at that company, they have a very young culture, and you can get a general understanding that they're very progressive, then, yeah, for sure, you can have your puppy there. It's not gonna be a big deal just to say, hey, this is my puppy, right? It actually may ease the conversation and guide the process to the interview a lot better. Now, I just wanna share with you one thing. A lot of the times interviews, people think that they are like transactions. Like I'm trying to get an opportunity with you and you're trying to hire me. It's a lot more complex than that. What you wanna consider is an interview is actually a conversation that should be humanized. All right. So we're trying to get information from you as recruiters as to how you fit the opportunity. But we also want to understand you as a human being. And that that component is as simple as saying, hi, my name is David. I'm actually a last year you know, accounting student. I heard about opportunities at your company. I've actually seen the portfolios you've worked on. And what really brought me into your company is that you have a lot of um, you have a, a work policy for pets on the job as I've seen one of my colleagues that work at your company. So I love that because I have a puppy myself, right? Something just as simple as that may help you break down the barriers to approach that interview. And it may not even have to be an interview. It can even be an elevator pitch. It can be you meeting someone for the first time, right? It's all about making the other person understand you better, humanizing the whole experience. That's really what makes a difference, connecting with them. Thank you so I much. Ask you, what, you know, okay, Elena, there was there's a story that uh, Alexandria, we all know Alexandria Onyedika, she shares a story about herself. Her interview when she was going to work with RBC, um, she showed up at that interview with her kids, two kids, because she was new to Canada, or new to Edmonton rather. She had no family, no friend. She doesn't have an income yet and no arrangement for daycare yet. And of course she needed a job. She wouldn't say, oh, because I don't have childcare, I'm not gonna show for my interview. But she showed up and upfront, she had taken permission to apologize to the host that, um, sorry, I couldn't um, get help. I'm here alone, new to Edmonton, no family, no friends. I don't know anybody yet, but I need this job. and I know I can deliver on this role. I'm gonna settle my children. They're not gonna distract this interview. Trust me, everything went smoothly. She had brought them games and activities to engage them in a corner while she faced that interview. And she aced the job. You know the good thing? The person who interviewed her was okay with it because she herself is a grandmother and understood the situation she found herself. So 
I'm saying this to say that don't judge yourself before you're judged. Okay. Yes, you might have shown up yeah. in a way that you didn't expect to show up, but own up and let them know what you've made or arrangements you've made to make sure that the core of the purpose is not interrupted. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you for exactly. like uh, April, any um, interesting question around? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, the amazing RBC team. I enjoyed your presentation a lot. So let's take the first question here. It's from Rosling. Um, can you please give some suggestions on the profile picture for LinkedIn? Does it have to be the traditional headshot with a plain background? Or could we have a, a one a little more creative, but still professional? For example, a picture taken in the workplace or posing in a lab co coat with animals actually, depending on line of work. Do you think it would make a difference to use the first or second approach? Good question. Thanks. It's a really good question. Could I answer this one? Yes, sure. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So the way I look is perfect. Thank you. The way I look at profile pictures is that you follow the basic criteria as best as you can, meaning that you try to have a clear image. You try to project a friendly appearance. So you want to smile, of course, and you want to make sure your background is not distracting. That's usually the three criteria. After that, you have a bit of freedom. What I mean is that if you want to showcase you in the work moment, right, and you're maybe professionally wearing a lab coat and you're doing something on the job, then perfectly fine because that actually will give someone context to you, right? People can get a lot of words and impressions from photos. And really, recruiters, sometimes we base off of um, the general complete picture we get from the candidate, not just a profile photo, but what they're saying in their profile too. Does it match up? Does it line up? What kind of overall feeling do we get from this individual? Gone are the days that we want you to wear suit and we want you to button up and put yourself and make yourself look very pretty in a profile picture and look very stiff. Gone are those days, okay? This is different because now recruiters are looking at what are some things that you're interested in as an individual? What are some things that you work on? Projects, right? How are you projecting your image that way? And your profile picture can include a component of those. For an example, I actually hired a candidate that was a photographer and he wanted to work um, at the bank because there was a particular role that he was quite interested in. Now for him and for his sake, his profile picture was him and his face and he was holding a camera up, right? And he, it was a portrait that he took a beautiful photo actually. And I connected the dots right away. I actually liked how that was relevant to his passion and his interests. And it invited for me to actually open the conversation and ask him more, right? So you want to view your profile picture as a professional invitation for someone to ask more of you, if that makes sense. Awesome, wonderful. I like your response. Okay. Be professional <laughs> and also maybe add a little bit of creativity idea, right? Thank you. Okay, next question. So I was just wondering, David, if you would call some, oh, no, sorry, wrong one. How, the question is, how to convince your prospective employer that your experience from another country is just as valid as the Canadian experience you have? So this um, question is, this is the problem that this question has. So they have great experience, but not from Canada. So what would your advice be to present that challenge? So as, if I can answer this, the way I look at it is that um, your qualifications only get you through the door. Okay, that means that basically your past experience, whether it's inside the country or outside of Canada, for example, they may invite someone to look deeper into your resume and might want to have a conversation with you. Whether or not that has anything to do about they consider international experience less important than Canadian experience, it's actually a myth, okay? I want to say this very clearly because when we do look at candidates, the soft skills that people acquire and the technical skills that people acquire, they're never discounted. As recruiters, we look at the complete picture. And if we say, oh, it's not Canadian experience, we would rule out a lot of very good talent, okay? Tomas, you might be also saying to me, well, David, that's not really the scenario I've been seeing, 
right? I've been seeing that when I apply to some companies, they say my lack of Canadian experience is what holds me back. Well, I want you to look at it from a different angle. If you can talk about your experience as connected to the project and how you're able to be performing well on the job, right? So let's say, for example, they, they ask you a question about, tell me a time when you encountered a situation where you didn't have an answer to help someone and you had to do something, right? That immediately opens up a lot of thoughts for you to connect your international experience. Your international experience is still 110% relevant. It helps you answer those questions, right? So I would encourage you to view it from this perspective and don't let it stop you from applying to as many opportunities as possible because that trend of Canadian experience matters the most. It's not true based on the numbers I'm seeing. We're hiring more individuals from all across the world. We're hiring record numbers of individuals that come here with more than one degree and more than one profession. So don't let that discourage you. Yeah, thank you for that answer, David. I think that's kind of a misconception. I must say that um, maybe some employers might have such policies, but with RBC, we know that one thing that makes us who we are is the diversity and inclusion, the wealth of experience that comes from people who have worked in other parts of the world. So we're always happy to harness those experiences from outside Canada, and it makes us what we are today. So never you believe the lie that you are not getting a role simply because you don't have Canadian experience. You disqualify yourself even before you're disqualified by thinking that way. So debunk that myth. Your experience from outside Canada is equally relevant. Just remember this. Many employers outside Canada have emphasis on your um, the technical skills. But here we're looking at your transferable skills, your soft skills. What makes you you that can make a difference when you get that job? And that's what you want to sell to the recruiters. So don't disqualify yourself. Don't discount yourself simply because you don't have Canadian experience. Yeah, thank you both for that perspective. I think it's very important to remember. I think there's some misconceptions across the board on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, David and Foley Kay. Um, I have another question here. So uh, the participant asked, I was wondering, David, if you would call someone, I, uh, he, he didn't, um, say it very clear here. So if I understand it clear, like you call someone for an um, interview before you search their social media profile. I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. I got it. Basically, Thank it's um, would you actually reach out to somebody and consider them before you search their social media profile? I think that's what I'm getting from it. Mm -hmm. And I'll try to answer it from that perspective, okay? Thanks. So the answer to this question is, in my role, because I deal with a high volume number of candidates, and I really have to be considerate of um, time and also the amount of candidates that go through my pool, they sometimes can be very equal as well, too, in terms of their qualifications. So um, do I actually search the social media profile before I call them? The answer for me is no. Okay. And I need to make that clear for you. I use social media as a guidance, as a tiebreaker, as also a general impression on somebody when it comes down to me already having pre-screened my candidates. So imagine if I have 200 candidates um, and I search through their social media profiles for each one, I wouldn't hire anybody because I would take all the time that I had to actually do my work. Rather, what I do is I narrow down based on the resume, based on their first criteria of like, you know, where are they residing? Are they close to the opportunity? Did they mention that they're open for relocation? Um, and also uh, best fit in terms of like their practical relevant experience, right? So in, in their experience, in their resume, is it connected to the job that I'm hiring for? So that helps me do my pre-screening component in terms of um, sifting through the candidates. And then as I get to, let's say the gold medalist, I decide on, Ideally, I like to narrow it down as much as possible, and I may have 10, 20, I may even have five sometimes, okay? Just depends on how far I want to push it in terms of um, having as many candidates that I want to compare from. Then at that point, I will spend more time 
maybe looking at social media and getting a general impression of that individual and maybe getting a feeling for what they're interested in doing, what are their hobbies, what are the projects they're currently working on, uh, how are they developing themselves. And ultimately, that might be a tiebreaker if I have two candidates that are quite similar, right? So that, that helps me at that moment to then go on to the next phase, which is, all right, now that I've narrowed it down, I may now only have three candidates to interview, right? And then from the three candidates to interview, after I interview them uh, and I get a good impression from them, they match what I'm looking for, I move over to the higher phase. I decide what happens from there, okay? Hope that makes sense. Social media is good. It's very important for you to have because you don't want to be caught not having it, especially if it comes down to you being compared to another candidate and both of you have very similar qualifications. Thank you for the answer. Actually, um, it's very important for job searchers, especially newcomers, to know what the employers are looking at from their resume or from their social media, their LinkedIn. It's super, super important for them to know about the employers or hiring managers' perspective. Thank you for sharing that, David. It's very important for us. Absolutely, so Elena, you're welcome. Elena, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A box. Oh, just one came in. So how much do you expect candidates to match the abilities required for the job in a rough estimate? For example, is it a good idea to apply for a job if I have 70 to 80% of the skills needed in the job posting? Most about to answer the question, never make an assumption that you feel like you're underqualified to not apply for an opportunity. Okay, most of the time recruiters use that as an understanding, right? So they use this as almost like a test in some ways to determine um, how dedicated the individual is to actually how bad do they want the opportunity, right? So if, for example, you look at a job posting and it says, we require you to have five years of experience, three years of experience, seven years of experience, and you're looking at yourself and you only have one, or maybe even just like eight months, right? You you disqualify yourself just by looking at that criteria alone because you're thinking, I don't match 70 to 80% of what they're looking for, right? That's just not really the way to look at it. In fact, you have the relevant practical experience inside of your schoolwork, past projects, past work, past volunteer experience, that might even match up 100% to the opportunity that you're applying to. So you can't make a general impression, oh, 70 to 80%, if I don't match, I shouldn't really go forward to the opportunity. Apply anyway, and let the recruiter decide how much you fit that particular hiring requirement that they have. Understanding this too, recruiters are one step of the puzzle. We have hiring managers that also make a decision to hire people too. So recruiters might be involved with looking at the talent, narrowing down the talent, right? Moving them to the next step. But sometimes in organizations, we have people that are the decision makers that recruiters work with, okay? Those are the hiring managers. And the hiring managers, sometimes, they rely on the recruiter's understanding of the candidate to make a decision to hire or not, right? So what I say is apply and provide enough information that matches the relevant requirements, right? Don't get 70 to 80% as a number or a rule of thumb. Apply and explain why you feel you're fit for the job and that will take you far enough, okay? I hope that makes sense. That's absolutely great, David. And now I want to share like when I was a program assistant at Norquest, my first job here in Canada, and I remember the recruiter, the HR person, came to my boss, the decision maker for the position they had opening. And this HR person said, uh, here are the selected people. So your role is like your pre-screening and provide to the decision maker. And the one on the top, you're gonna like it. So I remember this 22 years later, why did that mean? Who was that? I have no idea. But the way people pre-screen and then 
make the decisions is as the way. So your puppy, your uh, the photographic thing, that's what makes you make one decision and the other, like this additional unique thing. Thank you, David. Now I can see our boss, executive director, Dick Piquet join us with his input. Thank you, Doug, for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. This was so great. Thank you, uh, David and Falaki and Dennis. Uh, this, uh, just amazing. Just, I, I, again, I always say this at our sessions. I think I know everything until I, I, I participate in the sessions and I always pick up something, a gem that, I, you know, that I can take back for, you know, certainly for myself or for, you know, people that I work with. It's just really great information, and and I'm, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Elena and and Allison for uh, all of your coordination in April uh, doing the moderation. Uh, great, I've got two great teams that we get I get a chance to work with, and that's certainly the Eric team and the Craig team. So um, this was awesome. But you know, my comment really is, and it, it always seems to be those two sort of polar points, right? I mean, we got. Uh, David sort of providing a lens and and sort of a demystification of the whole process. You know, like I don't think that employers are are looking at trying to trick you or have this sort of mysterious concoction of of analysis that uh, that they do when they hire people. I think what I'm getting is that it's pretty straightforward, and you guys are very candid about the process. And I think uh, for newcomers, again, they're not trying to trip you up. What I heard today was they're trying to make it as easy for you as possible to, uh, you know, sort of present yourself in the best light po uh, possible. And, and of course, yeah, we're always looking for tips and formulas and what's the percentages. You know, I think, uh, David, you, you articulated it very well by just saying, you know, it's like, you know, present yourself in the best light and, and, uh, and, and, and apply. Um, unless it's way out of your skill sets and way out of, of your purview, I mean, like then then you know then you have to relook at your strategy for for uh, looking for work. So I what I'm I heard today was from the employer side, uh, 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 you know, sort of some lucidity and clarity and 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 demystification of what the process is about. But for the employee side, um, some um, self awareness is so important. And, and so I think what I heard and, you know, Dennis, your presentation on branding, you know, those kinds of things are just so, it's, there's a great tools, great insights from, from the sector, from, from professionals like yourselves, um, you know, being self-aware, every part of that journey, how you present yourself, take stock because there could be a detail that you miss out and, I, and i'll give you an example things like linkedin when i see people's linkedin profiles and there's no picture like i'm you know like did you not have time to put a picture in um you know so it tells me are you really serious about you know how you're presenting yourself or packaging yourself um so those kinds of things uh you know and then and, and even the quality of that picture or the content um, because the reality is employers look at those at that uh, at that profile at that optic of you so take good care about that I mean your what you're presenting to employers is a package that wants that needs to be attractive to them and so if you don't present yourself in in, in it's just sort of halfway presented then you're saying I'm halfway you know sort of providing the work that I need to get done. So it's kind of an indication of who you are. So uh, once again, I uh, I just thank uh, Royal Bank for being a part of this initiative and and uh, and, and providing illuminations to our, our clients um, across the province. And um, so thank you so much for, for once again, another engaging se uh, session. And, um, and yeah, look forward to any sort of positive or even critiques about what we heard today. If there's anything else, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Doug. Any last words for Lucky? Then I want to say that if, if you're looking at careers with RBC, connect with myself, connect with Dennis we will be able to point you in the right direction if you're not sure of how to proceed. So the person that asked a question in the chat around how they can package themselves in order to be competitive for a, for a customer service role, feel free to reach out to us. Look for us on LinkedIn. Practice what was just said, okay? 
connect with us and let's talk. Thank you for watching. In my follow-up email, I'm going to include your email for contacts in Edmonton, Dennis's email for contacts in Calgary, and also there will be more the recording of this webinar in case you want to share with some of your um, friends who are not able to attend, and also maybe a few videos that David is going to send us. Uh, so, Dennis, final words. Oh, just happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for taking time to attend. David, thanks a lot. I know I knew that uh, I could rely on you. <laughs> He's a very engaging person. And uh, yeah, guys, feel free to connect with David. I know he's quite busy too, so he might not reply to you right away, but uh, he might help you, uh, you know, guide your career journey uh, with RBC as well. Thank you, yes, Dennis. Uh, that's David. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I just want to say, Elena, one thing before we part. Yes, off yes, here. I'd like so, you to uh, final recommendations, <laughs> please. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you to everybody for being such engaging and wonderful participants. And that's always a mark of good presentation, especially when you take something away from the beginning and you leave with lessons that you otherwise would not have. But I want to say that um, if you do want to connect with me, find me on LinkedIn. Okay. That's a test of how bad you want to connect with me. And that also gives you practice too, for you to kind of um, put yourself out there. Don't be shy. Message me. Uh, message, you know, get in, get in the habit of reaching out to individuals and just humanizing the experience of having a conversation with them. Okay, that goes a long way. And the more you do it, the more practice you have with it, the more natural you will bring out your own brand. And that's all I have to share. Thank you so much, David. Thank you all guys. So I hope that today's learning event was a very good investment of your time, guys. And that the knowledge you gain today uh, will lead you to achieve success in Canada, doesn't matter what your profession is. So as I mentioned, you're going to receive the recordings and you're going to receive a um, brief survey, only two minutes, promise. Please fill it out because we really value, we really need your opinion, your feedback. That will be great. Yes, and thank you to our speakers for all of your amazing and insightful presentations today and for the important information that you provided on such an important topic of branding. Uh, thank you also to Kryak and Eric's partners, the immigrant serving providers who assisted with promotion and getting the word out about this exciting event. And of course, to all of you internationally educated professionals who attended today's event, thank you. And thank you, Doug, Elena, um, and April and to everyone who took played a part in making this possible. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. -bye.